Welcome to the Hershberg Entrepreneurship Institute's webinar series, Yes, We Can, Perspectives and Strategies for Success in 2021. We'll begin the webinar in about five minutes. Thank you for joining us. We'll start the webinar in about three minutes. Thank you for joining us. We'll start our webinar in about one minute. Welcome to the Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute's webinar series, Yes, We Can, Perspectives and Strategies for Success in 2021. In this webinar, we will, we will be utilizing the chat and the Q&A functions uh, down at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to ask a question of our panelists, you can press the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and a window will come up. Type your question on the bottom and then hit the send and the question will go straight to our panelists. If you wanna send something in the chat about technical issues, you can do that or any other information you'd like to share with other attendees, you can do that in the chat as well. But please reserve the Q&A for asking questions of our panelists. And thanks again for joining us. And now I'm happy to introduce to you, Gary Hirschberg. Whoop, Thanks, Caroline, um, and welcome back, everybody. This is now our second to last of our spring uh, webinars. We're going out with a bang as we uh, close out this season. Remember, of course, and we'll talk about this at the end, that we're coming up now quickly on our May Entrepreneurship Institute, May 5, 6, and 7. Uh, we'll pivot to that, and then I have some exciting news to follow about a uh, June and July series that we're going to be running with, with a heavy focus on retailers and distributors and because uh, many of you have really wanted that direct contact. So, uh, but today is uh, the topic that I think is on all of our minds. It's innovation and particularly innovation in this COVID era. You've now, if you've sort of followed the series from the beginning, uh, 
when we began, and even back last spring, you know, we've heard endlessly from uh, retailers, distributors, brokers uh, about the need for SKU rationalization, uh, about uh, the the um, the, the uh, impediments to getting product to, you know, customer service levels are still down in many cases. Um, uh, shoppers are shopping differently, uh, more value. Uh, and so many of us, you know, I'll be, give a perfect example for most of my career, 80% uh, of Stonyfield was single serve small cups. Single serve is now going away. It's now uh, drinkables, it's now pouches, it's now uh, quarts, large size, bulk size, et cetera, et cetera. Seth, who you'll of course know, and I'll introduce in 10 seconds, uh, you know, was a single serve guy also. I mean, honest tea, that's how, that's how we built the business. And and Walter brings a long legacy of long history of watching the evolution of our trade, but the market is different now. And so the key question is um, how, what, what kinds of guideposts can these two veterans offer us all uh, in terms of thinking anew about innovation now? Um, we, we have uh, more money in the market. We have more competition. Uh, in my day, if you got a product on the shelf, you had about a year to prove yourself. I know none of you under 40 can under believe that I said that, but you know, people like Walter, retailers back then were actually really nice. They gave you a year. Now they have algorithms and they know in 21 days, or they think they know if you're going to make it or not. And so the, com the competition, the pressure, the cost of failure is all, you know, at an all time, I think, torqued up level. So we have uh, two fabulous uh, speakers to address this topic today. Um, again, I really doubt either of you need introduction, but let me just say quickly, um, Seth is, uh, of course, the co-founder of Honesty and chair of the board of Beyond Meat, but you know he's worn so many hats. He's currently, and he's going to be speaking today about a couple of innovations that he and his family are engaged in right this second, literally launching during COVID. Uh, so we're going right to the you know, heart of the question. Uh, one is Eat the Change, which you'll see. It's a platform to inform and empower consumers to make dietary choices aligned with concerns around climate and health. And he'll explain all that. And for example, they have a line of organic mushroom jerky that is sitting on Walter's uh, table right this second. Um, I, I st stole some this weekend, but don't tell Walter. Um, and he's also uh, launched under the Eat the Change umbrella, something called Plant Burger, P-L-N-T which is a plant-based quick serve restaurant, which is basically you know, burgers, fries, shakes, soft serve. And then Seth and Julie, his wife, uh, have also launched a fund called ETC Impact, which is a grants program to donate a million bucks over the next three years to nonprofits that educate and inspire consumers to make climate conscious choices. So this is a family and a guy who's uh, walking uh, the talk and uh, innovating at probably uh, a higher level than any time in the I don't know, Seth, I can't remember how old you are, but in the 35 years that we've known each other. Uh, Walter, obviously, uh, again, has been with us many, many times. Um, he's an investor, he's a mentor, he's an advisor to all kinds of food companies. Um, I, I went over to his house to try to watch the women's final uh, basketball game the other day, but instead had to sample like 15 products that were spread all over his kitchen and refrigerator. And, you know, he's yakking the whole time. And I'm just trying to watch three pointers, but anyhow, uh, I love it. I'm, I'm just joking. But Walter uh, was of course the co-CEO uh, of Whole Foods, grew from a very small, innovative um, Northern California retail store that he uh, started and built uh, from scratch, then launched Northern California for Whole Foods, then became co-lead. And now he's transitioned into a different role um, where he's really, again, advising, mentoring, leading, guiding. Uh, he's an executive in residence at S2G Ventures, which probably many folks know. He's on the board of directors of Union Square Hospitality Group. Of course, most of us know Danny, who will be appearing at the Institute, Danny Meyer. Uh, Afria, which is a NASDAQ company, Live Kindly Collective, Appeal Sciences, and Hungry. But I can tell you, uh, Walter is just a guiding light for all kinds of uh, early stage entrepreneurs, including his own sons, um, and uh, very much uh, a thought leader on innovation. So that's what we're doing. I'm going to turn it to Walter in a second, but before I do, we do have one question, as usual, we want to ask you all. So uh, Carleen, if you can just post the poll. 
So uh, question, how has your diet changed since the pandemic? Um, go ahead, fill it out. You know what the drill um, hasn't changed. I'm eating more plant-based foods, eating more animal-based foods, uh, or I've gone vegetarian or, or vegan. Um, and we'll just take a half a minute for you to, it's a pretty, pretty light lift question today. All right. We got about a hundred of us, so let's see where we are. Well, about half have not really changed. And then the next largest group is eating more plant-based. I don't think that's a surprise to any of us. Interesting, nobody has gone vegetarian or vegan. Um, that's a very interesting. Well, uh, Seth, uh, that's, a, that's a good uh, guidance for you. And obviously uh, you're a trend leader, so here we go. So format, Walter's gonna talk about his uh, views on innovation. Uh, as Carlene said, use the Q&A, get your questions in. Um, if, if there's a couple of burning ones, we'll, we'll, we'll hit Walter with them, but otherwise we'll then pivot to Seth who'll talk about his own innovation views and current experiences, and then we'll open this up. So Walter, it's yours. Uh, muted, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Good? Oh, you're good, yeah. Okay. So I'm sure uh, for everyone that Seth joins me and thank you, Gary and Carlene for hosting these webinars for the industry and for the community and, and for creating a sense of community virtually when we've all been separated. Uh, thank you so much for doing that and for continuing to give your wisdom to help so many companies. Um, and I'm, I'm, listen, I'm excited to be here with Seth too, his longtime friend and uh, I'm a big admirer of hers and, and I'm sure you're gonna really enjoy his comments. And I think we're gonna yak some together at the end as well. So I just want to start out with thinking about innovation as a verb, not a noun. And I have a, I'll share with you something that Wendy, my assistant made for me. These are a little uh, deck of cards that have the different possibilities of things, uh, companies or ideas. This card, this one card I want to show you is called uh, Imagine Not Yet Created. It's a card I always keep in my deck, which I get out and uh, I lay them out in different combinations to sort of see how things might come together. Imagine Not Yet Created. And I say that because you're, because innovation sort of sits always as a verb at the intersection of two worlds, the world that we're living in every day and the world that we can imagine and create, right? So the innovation sits at that uh, juncture of possibility, which is why I say it's a verb. It's sort of like a, it's sort of like a attitude or a muscle that you carry inside that you, uh, that you can access your entire life in any moment and decide uh, if you want to, if you want to imagine and create something. And, uh, and uh, so anyways, that's I thought you'd appreciate that little uh, thing with the deck of cards. And like any moment, uh, it always has a context. And the context for this seminar today is the, is the finish is sort of the, the winding down of the COVID year, which has been a difficult year for everyone. And what uh, we've learned and, and it's been revealed, but is also what is possible going forward. And the way I see it, the way I was sharing with Seth and Gary the other day is this is the year uh, ahead is the time of great human reconciliation um, and great healing that has to happen as a result of this past year in so, on so many levels. And so I think that there, it's, it's like, um, we've always had this idea of creating a more uh, a better food system. I think uh, we've really deepened our understanding of what that means now to be a more equitable, more inclusive, obviously more aware and sensitive to the climate and the things that Seth will talk about later. And so in some ways, the calling when we started and Seth brought his first cases of honesty over to Whole Foods on his bicycle and Gary was pitching yogurt in the subways in New York. Um, our calling was not as clear or uh, it was clear, but maybe not as profound as it is at this particular moment, where now the challenges that we face in creating that more sustainable food system have taken on much wider dimension. And so, if you will, I think it's a moment of calling, a calling uh, uh, for these things that need to be thought through, addressed, and they are best addressed through innovation. You can never get to these answers just by cutting costs or cutting things. You're going to get there by growing into them and growing into the possibilities that we have not yet imagined or not yet created. And so that's really why I want to say innovation is a verb. But so second thing I want to say is really around uh, what's the North Star? Innovation for innovation's sake, just like technology for technology's sake, it, uh, doesn't really work quite as well as when you're putting it against a, a greater purpose. So I've suggested to you already what I think the purpose is, which is continue our work 
towards building a much more sustainable, in the broadest sense of that term, inclusive, equitable world uh, is really uh, and one that uh, is uh, friendly to, the, to our, the planet we inhabit, friendly to the communities that we serve, friendly to each other in ways that we see all of this has been ripped apart and ripped exposed in this last year. And that is the moment that we're in, and it is the moment of calling, and it's the opportunity for innovation against that larger purpose. So setting to task your innovative muscle against that larger setting and task is really the, is really the topic that, um, the, the way I'd like to think about innovation. So that being said, what is innovation? The definition is uh, innovare from the Latin, which means to new or to renew, which is a good reminder that innovation can happen uh, in lots of different directions. It can be a thinking of something brand new like what Seth has done with mushrooms, or it can be go back and rethink something that you've been doing that you say you wanna do differently. Uh, and both of them count equally as innovation. How you get there, it doesn't really matter. Now, Kevin Johnson who runs Starbucks, thinks about innovation in two buckets. One is the bucket of, um, I think as he told me, it's, uh, it's uh, incremental innovation. Uh, and, but then the second bucket is disruptive innovation. So incremental being something where you're, it's something you're already doing and you're adding a feature or, uh, for example, Domino's now lets you, uh, not that I've used this one, but now lets you track the driver bringing the pizza to your house, or you can tell the driver where you want them to put the pizza at your house. That's, a, that's an innovation, but is, is, it a, is it a disruptive innovation? I, I don't think so. But a disruptive innovation would be something where using technology to truly, truly create meaningful change. Let's say, for example, we were to figure out how to actually measure carbon capture in the ground in farming. That would be truly disruptive in terms of where that could take us. So in your in individual business, that might be a helpful frame. I'll give you some um, examples uh, later of what I think are uh, uh, incremental and disruptive technologies. But um, I want to just put, um, uh, by the way, that idea of disruptive leads to this sort of idea of what qualities does an innovator have? And again, again, this last year has been so instructive as to which qualities you need to cultivate in yourself. And those are really around creativity and agility, ability to pivot and respond and be agile. And, and you know, no one saw this coming to this extent. No one knew how to deal with it. There was no playbook for uh, how you fix a grocery store when the COVID hits and you can't shop or you can't shop the way you have shop. So you, you can't always anticipate it. Here it comes. Do you have the ability to pivot, to move, to respond? Uh, do you have the ability to, to uh, innovate uh, when something comes like that? So it's not always a matter of having a planning team that's thinking about something for a year. It's sometimes a matter of using your abilities in the moment. I think successful CEOs beyond the first quality of just being all in, there's no substitute for that. These new qualities have emerged as really defining successful leaders and innovators, and that is around agility and uh, the ability to make change. So let me give you some uh, five sort of rules of the road that I think Seth is going to speak to a little bit and that we can chat about later around innovation. Number one, it's, uh, it's tail stakes. In other words, you can't give ground. The market waits for nobody. You cannot give ground. And if, you're gonna, if you think you're gonna sit there and keep on doing what you're doing, it's gonna be good enough in today's marketplace, you're completely wrong, it's not. This is basic stuff, you have got to have an idea. And the sooner you get out there and try it and iterate against it, the sooner you're gonna figure out where the innovation possibility really lies. So the folks that figured out the Google glasses told me the secret to innovation for them was rapid prototyping. They took cardboard and they sat there and fussed with it 50 times until they figured it out. So if you're an entrepreneur, you're scrappy, you get out there, you try it, you figure it out, and you keep iterating, 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 rapid prototyping. If you don't try it, you're never going to know until you actually put it out in the market and check it out with customers. You won't know what you have. And so, and so the first thing is really get going. Get going and try it because you're going to learn more in the doing of it than you are in the extensive thinking about it. So that would be the first one. The second one is... Um, is, is to create a funnel. And, and that has to care, create a threshold for your innovative ideas. Is, is, it truly an, is it an idea or is it truly a business? Now there's different ways in which you can, you can check yourself on that. First of all, I would suggest to you that you figure out what you're aiming at. If it's, for example, Whole Foods, was it a store format? Was it a cultural practice? Was it a team member benefit practice? Um, 
in Amazon, for example, if you have an idea, you have to write up a six page press release that you put together and you have to explain the idea. And that determines whether or not you get funding for your first round inside of Amazon. At Starbucks, they discovered, Kevin told me during this recent time, that he, he wrote up four principles and, and against six pillars, sent them to his worldwide leadership, and then told him within that, you're going to make the decisions locally as to open a store or close a store. He calls it distributed leadership. But that's not where he was. He was a very centralized company. But this COVID, he wrote out four, four guiding principles and six pillars, sent them out to his entire team, and they made the decisions on the ground. Uh, in real time as to whether uh, as you saw their response, it was pretty darn good with respect to being able to get back open and serve their customers, whether their cafes were closed or not, resulting in many permanent changes for Starbucks, how they go to market. Uh, for Whole Foods example, also we gave our store team leaders $150,000 in CapEx to spend on their own authority, uh, which was very unheard of in the retail business at that time, uh, where they had to get centralized approval. They could make investments in their own store as they saw were necessary. Those are the sorts of ideas I think were, but again, what's your target in your funnel for your ideas? What are you aiming at so that you've got some clarity of focus around where you're aiming at? And, um, and it, it all are good, but just again, what you're trying to do is create some thresholds for whether it's truly a good idea or whether it's really a business idea. And you have to separate that out and, and uh, you have to be careful with your resources, both the time and money and not allocated to things which are which are fun and good ideas, but may not be a business or may not have a business model attached to it. Number three, you cannot silo innovation. It's not like the innovation team is over there and you're over here, or you know, they're over there and you're over here. Everybody has to own innovation. It has to be a collective enterprise. It has to be something that is across the entire uh, company, shared, uh, a shared commitment, a shared uh, responsibility to think about what are the next steps for the company, the next thing around the corner? If you have, if you set your culture up in such a way that it is in fact shared and where everyone feels that there's room and for them to help contribute to the shared future, uh, then you're gonna get a much faster pace of innovation. Example, for you in my own direct experience, after the great recession, 2008, if you look back, Whole Foods responded much, grew much faster, 08, 09, 10, and 2010 than the competitors, why? Because we were, uh, we had again uh, distributed the leadership, and we had a distributed culture, anyways, and we were able to respond much faster because there was ownership of that challenge and opportunity uh, in the marketplace. And so again, it's not siloed. Uh, next is not stifle it. You know, you could say one thing, but then, and then if an idea, somebody comes up with an idea and it doesn't get resourced either in terms of time or money, there's nowhere for it to go. So if you say we're gonna be innovators, we're gonna work around on innovation in our company, you have to be willing to back it up, which means you have to be willing to put time and money behind it. And uh, that's not a little thing to say because it's easy to say you are, but it's easy also to, uh, to say one thing and then have something else actually be team members experience. Best example for you in Whole Foods right now, I think is the Whole Cities Foundation, which we created to uh, work on inner city food access that program is actually 100%. The team members in the different communities pick the organizations in which they want to see whole cities invest. They actually co-submit the grant to whole cities, and the grant is given to those are selected by the whole cities. The team members are actually the one that nominate those organizations which are going to receive the money so that they can work on access. So again, um, not stifling it, but resourcing it. And finally, the last one of the five is to you got to make some bets. And I'm not talking about Johnny Appleseed throwing a few apple seeds out there to, you know, I'm talking about you got to make some bold bets and some big bets. Uh, if you want, if you want to truly make disruptive change, it's you've got to make real bets. So making sure that you're distinguishing between little bets and bold bets. Um, I'm in the big, I'd rather make fewer bets, but make bets, I think, and are really going to make an impact at this age, that advanced age that Gary, Seth and I are at. We don't have the same type of runway left we used to have. And so we might as well get to it and work on something that's going to have an impact as opposed to something that may take years in the making. So the five rules, number one is this is table stakes and you got to get out there, be scrappy and iterate, 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 prototype, 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 just keep going. Now, you won't learn until you do. Number two, uh, have, a, have a focus and a funnel uh, for your ideas that has some sort of thresholds 
and some sort of guidelines around what you're aiming at. Number three, don't silo the function of innovation. Uh, don't, uh, don't pretend that somebody can do it and the rest of you shouldn't do it. Everybody needs to do it. Number four, don't stifle it for lack of time or resources. And number five, be bold and make some bets. That's how you actually create change. Really so nice. I, I come back around and close around uh, this moment in time. I just don't know uh, if I could feel more profoundly uh, what this moment feels like in terms of the opportunity for humanity. Uh, Albert Schweitzer said, uh, the future of humanity depends on each and every one of us in every moment that we find ourselves displaying true humanity to one another. And I feel like we're in this moment now where that has never been more true than it is now, where we realize how much we've missed each other, how much we need each other, how much we do better when we with, with, work with each other. And I feel like the, uh, we're at this time where there's a calling uh, the planet is calling us, the communities are calling us, we're calling each other, let's rise up and use this muscle of innovation to meet this moment, meet this challenge, meet these times. So with that, I'll close off. Thank you very much. Back over you, G. Yeah, no, nice, nice summary, Walter, and uh, you're getting some nice comments. Look, you had me right up until the old guy comment. <laughs> totally lost me. I, um, after my organic breakfast this morning, I biked 30 miles and played tennis for an hour and a half. So I'm not taking this shit from you. Uh, all, right. but all kidding aside, all kidding aside. I mean, there's a, there's a wisdom here. And by the way, you know, we both know Seth's a baby compared to uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I think part of the wisdom that I just heard you summarize is uh, you got to know the times that you're in. You know, um, an idea can't exist in isolation. That's right. Uh, I think our ideas back then were excellent. Uh, we just, you know, uh, as I always say, we had a wonderful company, just no supply and no demand, right? We had the ideas, we didn't know how to make it. We didn't know how to make it effectively, that your business point, and we didn't know how to communicate it. I mean, we confused the hell out of people. And, you know, uh, eventually, uh, of course, we were ahead of our time, but I think uh, now you've got a very different time as you've so beautifully laid out, not only, of opportunity, but of challenge. And so that's a perfect setup for you, Seth, because yeah. you've done uh, a lot of innovating in a lot of different times, but this is a unique one, so go yeah. ahead. Great, thank you, Gary. And I just have to say, I can't start without just um, acknowledging what a, a honor it is to be with Gary and Walter. These are two people who have mentored me. I, I It's so weird for me to be talked about as a veteran because I do feel like I was raised in part by these two, um, and I guess the gray hair. <laughs> The lies of that I've aged over time. But Thank God you finally got gray. Jeez, getting <laughs> but, sick of that. No, I mean, the, the guidance, the inspiration, the mentorship, holding me accountable. I, I still remember, you know, when I called Walter to say Coca-Cola was going to be, you know, buying into honesty. And he, he said, look, you got to you got to step on the gas. You got to innovate. I tried to say nothing's going to change. Said, That's not what I want to hear. I want to hear more innovation. And, and, and Gary, you and know, you did. Yeah, yeah, helping me navigate through all of that just... Uh, my wish for everyone in this participating in this webinar today is that you find people and cultivate relationships uh, like these two. It's, uh, it's, it's been the blessing of, of my career to, to have that. Uh, it's just such a um, wonderful um, field to be in. And I, I totally want to echo both what uh, Gary and Walter said, that this is a, it's not just a unique moment of opportunity, it's a unique moment of need. And so, you know, every sort of the, the veil has been taken off to the extent people were covering their eyes about climate change, about um, the state of race relations. Like there's no playing around anymore. This is, it's, it's real, it's real, uh, all of it. And we have to address it and we have to take action. And that means that consumers get it too. And, and they are willing to follow and, and um, be inspired by us. So that opportunity wasn't around even, even a year ago. I mean, this conversation about innovation would have been, Hey, these are some great ideas. We got to table it for a year because no retailer is going to be taking a new product. Consumers have their heads down. They aren't looking for new brands. They're just trying to keep you know their families fed and safe. And so this is a really um, pivotal moment for our food system and for our society, just like Walter said. And so I want to share with you a little bit about how um, we're addressing it. And um, I'm going to share a few slides just to give you a sense of um, how I've approached it. So put this up and hopefully everybody can see. I've got here. Okay. Um, so as Gary mentioned, we have a, a, a restaurant 
uh, that we've launched. And it's funny, we, um, it, you can read it as Plant Burger. Um, this month we're calling it Planet Burger. The, the, the spelling doesn't change. Um, and I'm pictured here with my son, Jonah, and um, he's in charge of the marketing. And so you might say, well, that's nepotism, but Jonah was the one who actually inspired our whole family to be um, plant-based back when he was 10 years old. So uh, he has been and continues to be the most effective advocate for a plant-based diet of anybody I've met. And uh, among the things he, he's done is he came up with this phrase, which you can see just over our heads, eat the change you wish to see in the world. And of course, that's a play on the Gandhi, the phrase attributed to Gandhi. It turns out Gandhi didn't exactly say these words. He gave a long speech and somebody gave the Cliff Notes version, which was be the change you wish to see in the world. But when Jonah came up with that phrase, to me, it was so powerful because it, it's two things. Um, first of all, it's about accountability. Um, that, you know, the only way change in diet is going to happen is, is when you eat it, but it's also about empowerment. It means you have the, the, the ability, only you have the ability to choose what you eat. And, and, and so it's incumbent on us to, to act and think that way. And so um, as I saw Plant Burger growing, and we now have seven of these restaurants up and running in the, in the mid-Atlantic, and we'll be expanding um, north and south in the, in the coming months, um, but as I saw them growing, I thought, well, that's such a powerful call to action. What else can we do with that phrase? And so I, I sat with uh, my wife and some other friends and I said, well, how do we make Eat the Change into a nonprofit? And I think this is a really important question. And it's something that a lot of people in this audience can probably relate to because my guess is a lot of you are, are running nonprofits right now. There are businesses that are trying to be profitable, but just by design, um, you know, they're not yet profitable. And, and of course, those who know Gary's story know that he worked you know, in nonprofit as well. Um, and the reason it's important to do that is because that really helps you define what kind of impact you want to have. And then the next question we asked after we thought about the nonprofit is how do we make Eat the Change into a for-profit brand? But let's start with a nonprofit first. Um, uh, my wife and I are um, I'm chairman of the board of Beyond Meat. And so we had um, some Beyond Meat investments that um, when the company went public, we were able to convert into charitable dollars. And so we said, well, what would we want to focus donations on? And so we said, well, if, if, if it was an Eat the Change Impact grant program, what would that look like? And so we looked for partners who really stressed the value of eating with intention, making mindful choices. We wanted to make sure we were relying on fact-based science as opposed to just throwing out ideas about, oh, we think you know, uh, this particular thing is, is going to be environmentally based. We wanted to make sure we could democratize plant-friendly diets, help make sure that these are diets are available to people who don't normally have access to plant-friendly diets, either for education or, or distribution access or economic access. And then we wanted to make sure we were uh, identifying and valuing innovation. And so we gave out um, a third of a million dollars last year. We received over 120 grants and we gave out 26 um, to 26 different organizations. Here's a little bit of the sampling of them. But um, for us, it was by when uh, interacting with these organizations, we learned a lot about um, what kind of role um, changing diet can play in communities. And one of the great inspirations in the top left is this woman, Tracy McWhorter, who has an organization I love called By Any Greens Necessary. And she successfully convert, uh, recruited 10,000 black women to go vegan, um, just uh, persuading them around the health benefits and, and even an education about the, the systemic racism that's really embedded in, in our food system. Um, but other organizations like um, uh, in DC, as, uh, Greens in DC, which helped provide, helped communities gain access to um, use, converting food stamps to gain um, access to produce. And so really empowering communities to, to um, shift their diets, in, in some cases to nudge them. And so that was kind of the form uh, the, that's how we shape, shape the values. And then something happened at the restaurant that really inspired us as well. We um, had a mushroom bacon barbecue burger that's delicious. And I knew the supplier, it's, a, it's an organic family, fourth generation family farm in uh, Pennsylvania. And I arranged for the, the, our chef and, and the founders to go visit this farm. And as we were walking through the um, mushroom farm and it's mostly inside buildings, we came across this thing on the left here, and you can look at it. It, uh, it looks a bit like a brain material. It, it's the fruiting body of an oyster mushroom. And our guide uh, was taking those mushrooms and um, showing us them, and they were just being put into the compost bin. 
And I said, well, what, what about that? She said, well, you know, they don't really look that attractive. You don't, we don't sell those in the market. But she said, I, I take them home sometime and I can make a poor man's crab cake. And as soon as we heard that, we said, oh, wait a minute. So that's food waste that could be made into food. Um, and so we found a way to um, blanch them and fry them. And we brought out something called the crispy chicken fungi, which is actually now one of our top selling sandwiches. And it tastes like chicken. It's a delicious sandwich. And then I got us thinking, OK, well, here we go. We've got um, mushrooms, which are one of the most sustainable crops grown. The mushrooms are grown in um, seven layers high, and yet they still rely on dirt. They are really farm products. These aren't hydroponic products. Um, and they feed on waste. Um, what could we do with that? And that led us to really recognize we could create a brand, and this is leading now to the evolution of, of the Eat the Change brand, that could be plant and fungi-based. And initially we were talking plant-based, you know, certainly my background would be on meat. We know the value of plant-based food, but it turns out that fungi aren't plants. They're a separate kingdom. So we really had to talk about, we shifted it from plant-based to, to, we call it planet-based. We also, um, given my background and work, we knew it had to be organic because organ only organic is the way to ensure a crop is grown uh, in a way that focuses on regenerative soil, on uh, avoiding chemical pesticides and cleaner ingredients and no GMOs. Um, we knew there was an opportunity uh, just in what we learned for the restaurant to upcycle imperfect produce. And the thing that, especially about mushrooms, is that uh, you take the portobello, when you go to the supermarket and you can buy those port portobello caps, well, most mushrooms don't grow to that spec. And so all the ones that are either too large or too small or the stems don't make it to market. And so a great way to address food waste would be to take all those mushrooms that aren't uh, you know, aren't uh, sold in stores. Then, of course, we knew we wanted to um, fo focus on a recyclable packaging at the least. I mean, certainly over time, we hope to do better than recyclable, but make sure that we had a commitment there. And then the, the, the fifth commitment to me, which is perhaps most novel, is as we learn more about the agricultural system, it turns out there are six crops that are responsible for more than 57% of all agricultural output. And we said, well, what if we can make a product without any soy, corn, wheat, rice, potatoes, or sugar, which by the way, sometimes they're allergens, um, but that would also be a way to make a commitment to biodiversity. And uh, fortunately, my co-founder in this enterprise is uh, Spike Mendelson, the, the celebrity chef from Top Chef. And he said, well, you're just telling me this is what's in my basket. I'm gonna make food with whatever you put in my basket and you're, <laughs> you're leaving out those ingredients. Uh, so those were the ways for us to manifest the commitment. And, and I, I think um, creating a brand is a lot like poetry. You know, if someone just says, write a poem, it's really hard to do. But if you put out guardrails, it becomes easier if you understand the definition. And so for us, these plant-based commitments are the guardrails of our brand. And so then we said, well, how do we create a, a logo that communicates that? We talked about our brand theme. So first, first of all, recognizing our sing single biggest interaction with our planet is what we eat a recognition that we're all connected. What we do on one side of the planet has an impact on the other. And then this call to empowerment, to make diets more harmonious with their concerns about the environment. So the words that kept coming across, you know, were harmony, balance, planet, and connectedness. And so we, uh, we worked with our, um, actually my old Honest Tea um, friends who, who helped us work on the graphics there. And we came up with this logo. And uh, so this is our Eat the Change logo. And for us, you could look at it as uh, earth and uh, ocean and harmony. You could look at it as a wave of change. Some look at it and see an embryo. Some people see a, something evocative of the yin yang. And I, I sort of, you know, from my point of view, it's all of the above. We want to um, communicate that through the brand. And then we had to think about the product. And as I mentioned, you can see over in the right, these are some of the mushrooms that we source and they're all types of different sizes. None of those mushrooms are ready for um, a retail shelf, but they are perfect uh, when it comes to making uh, mushroom jerky. And so um, what we were able to do, and I think one of the twists was we, we found a meat packing plant that smokes their meat. Uh, and we were able to smoke our mushrooms with the same hickory wood smoke. And that imparts a really unique flavor um, especially when it combined with our chef's recipes. And so we developed these five chef crafted flavors and uh, we're just in the market. We just, this is really um, our first, we just finished our first full quarter of being available. But, you know, obviously we started with mushrooms, but the, as you, I hope you can hear from the brand, uh, this presentation, the guardrails are there. And so we can go in lots of different directions all around, um, you know, repurposing uh, imperfect food thinking about extending the shelf life to prevent food waste uh, and bringing nutrient dense products to people. 
Uh, one of the fun things that we've just launched this month is our Eat the Change Incredible Planet Challenge. This is available through our website and on Instagram. And it is um, in, totally in line with our values. The 21 days leading up to Earth Day, every day we're incur trying to nudge people towards more planet-friendly foods. So the first day was swapping out dairy milk for plant-based milk. Yesterday was having um, 12 different fruits and vegetables to, to help people expand their diets. And we've got lots of great partners involved. Um, and every day, just part of that challenge, this isn't about selling mushrooms. This is really about building a movement, about bringing others along with us, inspiring others to, to join us in this journey. And, and uh, you know, um, it still goes back to that question, are we a nonprofit or a for-profit? These days, we're certainly a nonprofit. We hope to become a for-profit at some point. But, um, you know, I think the one uh, important reason I, I think about that question in the beginning is because you never know if your company is going to work. And, and there were, I was going to say there were years, there were, there were days, there were years uh, at a time, almost a, a decade where you, I wasn't sure honesty was going to work. Uh, and for that matter, it would be on me. But when you're building an organization, a, a brand where you feel like the cause is that important to you, you, you can do it as a nonprofit, then even if it doesn't work out, you, there's no regrets. I mean, you can say, well, I wish we had you know, bought from that, that supplier, but you're never going to regret pursuing a, a, a business that's the manifestation of your values. That's ultimately what I think, you know, every um, fulfilled entrepreneur uh, seeks to do. That's great. Um, so let me pile on really quickly uh, in a very different direction, which, you know, we're talking to a retailer, a lifelong retailer here. Um, you're, you guys have both laid out the context, the values, the mandate, the opportunity. Uh, but, and you just alluded to the economics at the end, Seth, there's obviously a cash flow cost to innovating. Uh, how's the marketplace right now? And, and specifically what I wanna ask is, you know, in mushroom, as, as you know, I'm involved with a mycelium yeah. product that's coming to market. Uh, it's crowded and, and not only crowded, but it's crowded with money. Um, big, big money. Walter, you're an advisor, some serious money. Uh, how do you guys coach our viewers here about navigating the, uh, you know, obviously there's a mandate for speed, but you also don't get many, if you mess up, it's hard, right? So can you talk to us all a little bit about the practicalities of bringing these great things to market? Both of you? Yeah. You want me to go first, Seth? Sure. Well, first of all, Gary, I think, again, part of this moment is we are witnessing, as Seth referenced, the single largest uh, trend I have seen in my 40 years as a grocer, which is the customer's desire to eat more plant-based foods or to eat more healthy. I I've never seen anything as widespread as this as um, in, in my whole career. And I think you're looking at a market that could, well so in other words, you're going into an expanding market. The opportunity is growing, not shrinking. Number two is you have more paths to market now than you ever had five years ago or 10 years ago. You, you can go direct to your customer and you can do it like in the old days, you used to go to the subway in New York and hand out things. But you can do that virtually. You can do it in ways that, and, and the opportunities with social commerce where you can, uh, with very little money, participate uh, on these platforms and actually sell direct to the customers. Now, the economics of those channels, that's a question. And ultimately, I think to build a durable business model, you'll need to do more than that. But you could build a three to five million dollars in sales online in ways that just weren't possible five years. So second of all, you have you have many more paths to market uh, than you had five years ago. And you need to use any and all of them, because in the end, the cu your customer is probably on all of them or on many of them. And so and the goal is to serve the customer. And, and third would be, again, just remember that to try to you have to in this time know who your customer is. And you have to get the information, however you get that, the data, the information, because otherwise you're competing against brands that do have that information. You're going to be a, a dis, you're going to be one down because unless you start to know who your customer is, what their patterns, there's now AI and machine learning that are coming into play for many companies that are that are accelerating their learning, and um, you know, and so you're you're dealing with a, a an age of humanity, but one that's also an age of uh, incredible innovation in technology and data. So those platforms in and of themselves, but if you can somehow harness or use those or partner with those 
to help you really understand who your customer is to be able to serve them better. That would be a third observation. So expanding opportunity, um, using all the channels, and then a, a, just a, a laser-like focus on your customer and getting to know them and serve them. And those are old school values there, by the way. I mean, they're what when I started my first retail store in 78 in a small town of 5,000 people, any, any one customer that came in the door, I had to make sure I get some business there, right? So yeah. you know, it's, it's fundamental retail. It's like you got to look after that customer and it's the same thing in today's world. And so people often look, you know, remember that every little sale you make helps to build a brand. And so yeah. I'll, I'll let Seth talk about building yeah, a brand. So Seth, I, yeah. I, I want to just quickly amp on to that and let you go. Uh, you know, you're following Walter's point. You're launching in multi, multiple channels. Yeah. Uh, even multiple formats. I mean, you're doing nonprofit commerce as well as. Um, what are your practical guidances to people? And yeah. and um, if I could just sneak this in, because Walter, I'll come back to you on this. Uh, think about people on this webinar who might have a great idea, but they're hearing your calls for urgency and opportunity yeah. and investment, and they're wondering whether to take the money. Like. Yeah. What about that? I mean, you're self-financing, but you know, there's a lot of money being thrown around. Yeah. And, and just, so I'd love you, you guys yeah. to talk about that. Yeah, yeah a few things. First of all, um, the, the, the innovation, there is money for innovation out there, but it has to really be different. Like there's not money out there for a, a follow on me too uh, type of opportunity. You have to have something that is manifestly different. And the other piece is around taste. You don't score points for, <laughs> You know, being the first to be able to create something if it doesn't taste great, it just doesn't. Uh, the, the market, you know, has every you 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 know you can win. You get some side points for you know environmental um, responsibility and all. But we deliberately chose on our product. We said chef crafted, planet based. We didn't go planet based chef crafted because the chef crafted has to come first. Um, and in terms of the the money, um, there is because it is so competitive now. You do. At the right time, you want to take money um, to grow. You can't sort of do, you know, in honesty, we raised $10 million over 10 years, and that allowed us to basically sort of make growth every year happen, but but learn along the way. Once you prove the model, once the proof of concept is done, then you've got to go. And like with the restaurants, we're just, you know, we had a hard, the restaurants went through a hard time in November where the, the, the world shut down. It was sort yeah, of, this, you consumers. Know, you need yeah, to yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden it's just gone back up now and it's really exploding. And we're like, okay, it's proven. Now we've got to go because we can't create, dem prove a model and then let others capture it. So um, when the proof of concept is done, that's the time to raise the money. And when you're go launching into retail right now, like there was a nice comment about your Air One, yeah. your, your display at Air One. And of course, Air One is a unique case, right? Yeah. And, and we have, uh, Dean from Dean's is on today and Mike from Earth Fair. We've got a bunch of retailers joining us who I, I hope will offer some comments um, yeah. in the chat. But uh, what are you what are you seeing for timelines? Uh, in other words, how long do you have to prove yourself and yeah. thresholds and yeah. and also uh, how do you address the fact that a lot of people are coming into mushrooms, for example. Yeah, well, or, or even into this cat, the broad category of uh, plant-based plant yeah. jerky. I mean, so what's interesting, the spins data, and I obviously didn't know this before I got into it, but this, the most recent 12 months, plant-based jerky was the fastest growing category in natural grocery. Um, so, so that kind of buys us an opportunity where, you know, buyers are, are, are going to see a lot of just secular growth and we're, we'll get to be part of it. Um, but we've got to make sure, you know, my goal would be within six months, we're outperforming the category. We have to, uh, and, and doesn't mean we're the number one, but we, you know, can demonstrate that. It's so one thing that's striking is this category is so different than beverage. You know, I, I you come in with honesty and we'll be selling, you know, a few cases a day. And I, I heard, you know, our first week at Giant, um, we sold a, a, a number that was, you know, sort of, they were telling me like units. Um, per week. And I'm like, wait, what? That per day? And they're like, no, that's per week. And so you just have to um, recognize the category you're in, where you start from. And I think as long as you can get a buyer to understand this is a growth opportunity, it's not going to light the world on fire, then you help build a category with them. So that's, that's I think, where the opportunity becomes fun and exciting. And just to go a page out of the, the Beyond Meat playbook, we went to, to Giant. They were doing 
minimal numbers with Beyond Meat. And I, I happened to have a dinner um, where I sat across from the CEO. I said, you're just missing the boat, totally missing it. And I said, you got in the freezer. And he, he uh, for, well, to, his, to my appreciation, he said, all right, let's give it a try. And we put in a plant-based meat section and they became a best in class retailer. And this guy got promoted to be head of stop and shop, not only for that, but for other reasons. But, you know, he, he, he it captured his imagination. So if you can capture a buyer's imagination and they take the ride with you, then it can be a really fun, rewarding for on both sides. And, and that's what I think as an entrepreneur, you have to do that. That, that was, by the, way, by the way, that was a disruptive step that was taken there was to actually the first to put the Beyond Meat in the actual meat department as opposed right. to Oh, so that's what actually led to the boom, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And we're doing the well, same with jerky. Wearing, yeah, wearing your retailer hat, what's your, do you have some, I mean, what are your thoughts about this market? And I'm, again, I'm, I'm hyper attentive to the, you know, the, there's the amped up opportunity. There's also the amped up competition, right? I mean, there's a lot of players, a lot of money and retailers are, right now are, under pressure, you know, to make up for a tough year, low traffic, low service levels. You know, do you have guide points for folks who are thinking, okay, I got the cool idea now. Yeah. Just to make sure they really succeed. They don't just get a single, they get a double or a triple. Yeah. Well, I mean, as, as I mentioned before, make sure that it's a it's a real business and not just an idea. That's the first thing. As if, uh, Seth just said, if you go with just a Me Too thing, that's not really doesn't really stand out or doesn't have a quality to it. Dude. And then I think you, you're asking a lot to expect the retailer to do that. Look, I mean, retail is ultimately about relationship and you, and uh, unfortunately it's just, a, there's a, there's a lot of uh, a turnover that happens there in those positions, which makes it harder to build long-term relationships, it seems. And so, um, but ultimately creating a great product is number one for truly yeah. taking the time to create a great product or a great brand or something that is really gets folks excited. The good news is that retailers are looking or falling over each other to try to be the first out there or be out there with these products. They are, they've opened up their doors in terms of investment funds, in terms of placement, in terms of various programs, even Target. These are falling over themselves to say, bring me this stuff so that I can take it to market. Yeah. Um, but it says that if you don't, there's about a half, you know, Goldman Sachs with a half a trillion dollars of cash sitting on the sidelines. A lot of money washing around the world right now. All money is not created equal, just like all food is not created. Equal. We know that. And so yeah. it's so important to find somebody that partners up with you in the right way, because there's money is around. But obviously, I, I work with S2G, so does Seth does something, they, and they're good people, and they uh, they do work at a certain stage, early venture companies, they do they do loans, but there's many sources of money. But I think making sure that the, the values are aligned uh, first is really uh, important. Yeah. You're, you're asking me a question about you know, selling to retailers or investing. There's two sets of questions there. But I will say that my experience uh, now that I'm on the other side of the table, and I know most of the retailers is it's uneven. Let's be fair. A lot of retailers, are, it's uneven. They don't call back. They don't respond. Uh, they, yeah. they don't get the rational. It makes no sense. You know, I mean, so and, and some of them are, are like deep into partnership and really, truly build brand partnerships. And so. The thing is, find one where you can establish a, a toehold and build on that because that's where you'll build your visibility. Yeah. And uh, not going to convince everybody the first time. They're not going to take all your screws, despite the fact that you love all your children. That's just not going to happen. So, so, but go where you where you can find the love and the connection and build a toehold yeah. and, and take it from there. And and as Seth says, if you don't start taking some money, you're going to be at a disadvantage in today's market because. Your competitors will, they'll bulk up their balance sheet and they'll just nudge you to the side. So you can't take more than you want to dilute the hell out of yourself, but you can't not, you can't reasonably not take it either. So, so figuring out that what time is the right amount, it's probably worth the seminar in and of itself, Gary. Yeah. Folks I mean, that, you know, kind well, of. We have it coming next week. I <laughs> oh, actually, I, I, I want to frame a comment at, by way of getting to a question. And then we've got a couple from uh, the audience too. And I encourage others to get your questions in the Q&A. So uh, I mentioned Dean Nelson's on with us. Uh, Dean is a regular attendee. If you don't know Dean, I know you two do, but for everybody else, if you don't know Dean's incredible stores uh, in New Jersey, the natural, Dean's Natural Foods, you, you, you gotta check them out, I mean, best in class. And um, Dean, co Dean's comment to back you up, Walter, is he said, most of us believe profoundly in what we do and why we do it, we refuse to fail. It was never about money. Money was the byproduct of living our mission. I mean. Now we don't have a lot of 
a lot of retailers like that. We, we, it happens next week. We've got a couple more. We've got Jimbo uh, Samba coming on and we've got Mike from uh, Earth Fair talking about what they're doing down there. And obviously, Walter, you've been you know, one of these sort of visionary uh, retailers. But, but um, so I want to go from that global to a very mechanical. You just mentioned like Seth, like you had this great piece of timing, which is the meat person wanted to move mushrooms into meat which is great. I remember when Bolt House um, broke out of, um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the perishable and got into produce, right? Um, so I have an entrepreneur, I can't name names, who has been struggling with um, a certain former employer of yours, Walter, as well as some other retailers, um, because there's, he's got a great innovation, but no location for it. Yeah. And they just lump a lot of that stuff into, in this case, um, uh, whole body, which is, there's a lot of skews in whole body, right? It's crowded. And of course, he and everybody else, probably half the people on this call, they're saying, well, this is real easy. If they just give us a set, you know, I mean, right now it's powders or shots or they give us a set, you know, a case, an end cap, cap like that you broke into, Seth, when you launched Honest, uh, no problem. But of course, that's a major re-engineering feed. It's a giant, you know, financial question, especially at the scale of Whole Foods. And, and, and the problem is, is that the, the retailers aren't able to respond as quickly to that. And of course, everyone wants to be grabbing yeah. that one impulse. So what I'd like you guys to comment on is, I mean, you, may, you both just said, said it, grab the money if you got it. And by the way, I totally agree with that. Don't mess around. Yeah, grab it when you prove the concept. That's my only caveat. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, yeah, I meant yeah. to underscore that. I agree. Yeah. But, but what advice do you have for folks who may have an idea for which there isn't a location. Now, Walter, just to save you repeating, you just said it, you know, there's a lot of other channels to get to the consumer, a lot of ways to create pull through now that didn't exist in Seth's and my, in your day. But um, how do you help retailers to see where you need to be? Because otherwise, if you're in the wrong place or you're yeah. caught in a overly skewed section, you're dead. I, I think it all goes back to proving the concept. So, you know, if you can't get a chain to do it, Go to an independent. I mean, even you know, with, with Walter with Beyond Meat, that we only went to the Boulder Pearl Street store. Like that was the only place we you know started and said, let's put it in the meat section there. And it, and so one literally one store. And you know, we mentioned Erwan. I'm going to be this month. I'm going to be in everywhere Erwan store. I'm um, doing samples. We in, in the world of um, challenging samples, we made these little mini mini mini. This is literally like one <laughs> one mushroom it's size man. sample because you can't you know you can't give out samples the way you used to. But I'm going to be yeah. in every air all five Air One stores giving out samples and uh, to help build the case. Uh, so you know it's it's only five stores, but it's important stores. And it's if we can demonstrate proof of concept there, that's the data we can take somewhere else. Of course, we want to succeed in Air One as well, but. You know, you, you don't need 30 stores to prove a concept. Five is fine, two is fine, yeah. if they're the okay, right perfect. stores. That's sort of where I wanted to go. I mean, I think what you're saying, in other words, is not just prove the, the food concept, it gets back to Walter's point, Virtual is it an AR yeah. business, prove the, prove, prove the business concept. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, you, you guys have to realize when having said on the other side of the desk, that the, the number of things that they asked and request and for new products come in, are, it's 10,000 a year. It's just yeah. an extraordinary amount. and. You know, you're thinking about yours, but the retailers, you know, it's just an, it's a, it's constant inbound, and so they're looking for some way, some filter. So uh, one things would be, get get your story, I mean, tighten up your story a little bit, and and don't take so much time to get to the point. So a, a lot a lot of entrepreneurs they, they stem wine for, for you know an hour on their thing, and and it's just 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 not the not time. Nice. That's not that's not retail time. Mushroom stem wine. <laughs> Get to the point and really headline, uh, and also recognize that that um, you know that it, you know how do you get some visibility? You've got to do some of that work on visibility yourself, which is to say, uh, you know, uh, I actually have an example for you here, uh, Carlene. If we could put the first, not Mary Dillon slide, but the, the second two slides up, I'd like to show that as an example. This is a uh, Alex Peabody that, that's running Bev, which is a canned wine company. To, you know, chicks for wine. I don't know if you've seen this brand. It's really exploding around uh, the EPM. Uh, Carlene, if can those, if you can bring those up. So, so she, she saw, she, she uh, had a part of her friends uh, work for Google. So you could use the Google bus on the weekend um, for your, so she got the Google bus and, and sent out an invite and had people come to a place where she could serve her wine. And the next slide shows you the gathering. 
If you show the next slide, Carlene. Next, advance to the next slide. Yes, yeah, she's trying. Okay, yeah, uh, and and um, well, we're we're coming. But the point of it is that you uh, she she made up this event, uh, figured out the Google bus. I guess we didn't get that slide, but uh, all of a sudden these people gathered and they became uh, the customers for this product and she was off to the races and she had created the visibility through her own innovation, her own ideas, her own energy. So, so get to the point, uh, create the energy yourself. Don't expect the retailer to do it on their own. Yeah. And third is in the figure out uh, the retail partner who wants to partner with you and, and start there, like Seth said. And do what you say that that's, I'm sure, you know, you, you get a lot, not only you get stem winders from entrepreneurs, but they, Give you a big show and then they walk away and they don't show up and, and i and, 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 and uh, as a follow-up to that i should highlight there are six air one stores i'll be at as opposed to <laughs> yeah well by, by the way it, it's not true on the on the on the sampling retailers are you know retailers want that traffic retailers are all trying to figure out how to open back up we know the traffic probably won't come back the way it was but actually i think you're going to find retailers say please come and sample now yeah. because you're going to, you're going to part, help us be part of creating the experience uh, of coming to a physical store versus doing it digitally. So I would think this would be a moment for the innovative ones of you to figure out like what Seth did already uh, yeah. to contribute to the, to the reopening of physical retail, which by the way, remember as big as Amazon is 40% digital share, they're less than 5% of what's totally goods and services sold in the United States. So they don't own everything. Yeah. And most of the shopping's done physically. And folks have been missing that. They want that physical yeah. experience. Sampling yeah. is part of that. And you can help do that. If you want to get out there now, I think I think retailers are booking. Some retailers are booking samplers and they don't have enough that are willing to sample. So don't assume yeah. that. Assume the opposite and until you're told otherwise, right? Uh, you it's, it's safe to assume people haven't sampled anything in a store for a year. So you're... Yeah. <laughs> you're so you got, and I just have to say, you're both teeing up beautifully. Our final session next week with with um, two you know premier retailers on on each each coast to, to, to independence um, so let me also uh, take a page and give you guys another quick example and then I'm going to go to a question on our Q and a um, I I'm involved with another company well I actually I can mention him Luke uh, uh, who was on Bergeron who was on the other day with his wine um, his his curator wine business, he uh, made an offer to the community. You know, we do these five minute offers. Now Luke started out as a wine club pre COVID, but nobody's, you know, doing events, right? They're not having guests, and they, yeah. you know, even three bottles a month is, you know, a decent amount for. Uh, although wine consumption, alcohol consumption is up, so um, he's done this incredible pivot, uh, which is to uh, companies who want to reward their employees who want to uh, provide gifts. Like you said at the beginning, Walter, we're all isolated. Want to remind folks we're in a community that you can label your own, you know, put your own label on uh, his wines. And so I did a retirement party for somebody you both know, my longtime COO, uh, CFO last week. And, you know, we, we ordered 10 cases of private label wine honoring her 29 years leading Stonyfield. Um, and, and he's really taking off with this thing. And now there's you know, Bodie Miller, the, the ski racer, is uh, wants to do a line. Uh, his wife, Morgan, the professional volleyball player, wants to do. So, you know, think about your format is my point. Um, yeah. and, uh, so, and, and it's another way, of course, to sample. So Manoli here is asking, a, we're going in a different direction with this question, but I think it's important that we, I, I wanted to hammer on retail because I think it's, most people are trying to figure this out, but he says, it seems that science-based research and discoveries are playing a larger role in food industry innovations, new category creation and funding opportunities, e.g. microbiome, precision fermentation. How do you both see this evolving, uh, science-based research and discoveries in uh, our space? Yeah, well, I mean, I look beyond meat as, a, as testimony to that, right? That, uh, you know, I mentioned Honest Tea raised $10 million in its first 10 years and Beyond Meat raised over 150 million. So it's, you know, because it, it is real science there. I mean, what we're doing here at Eat the Change and at Honest Tea is, is kitchen work. It's creative kitchen work. And I don't mean to belittle that in any way, but what they're doing at Beyond Meat is science-based biologists, chemists, you know, hard science work. Um, and so uh, I think it's in the, you know, when it's in the name of 
pivoting our food system, and, and in this case, the largest category of food, the meat business, uh, away from animal-based, it is it is a significantly big enough opportunity that it's worth doing. And, and we have now over 120 scientists uh, in California, you know, trying to make uh, meat from plants. And, and it is that's not a small task. And it's especially as it continues to iterate, the science becomes more and more sophisticated and uh, it's needed. You can't, you, can't, you can't do that in a kitchen. So yeah. I think for the right scale of the opportunity, uh, it's, it makes sense and it is worth the investment. Well, so before, I'm, I'm, Walter, I'm, hang on one second. Before you respond, there's a second part to this because I want to hear Seth and I want you to respond to both. So, because Paloma is following up saying, from your research, Seth, is there a growing customer base that favors what, what she's calling clean natural plant-based food uh, yeah. uh, versus lab meat alternatives. Just love to hear your learnings and then I want to get Walter on that. Yeah, well, it, there's not, it's not just clean versus lab meat. It's also clean versus GMO, right? There, there are certain meat, plant-based meat companies that are taking a GMO approach. I don't think that's the smart move. And, you know, as people look for more transparency in food, I think they want to be able to understand uh, foods that they know and foods that are um, proven, you know, safe over years, not you know, sort of flash approvals or uh, mm -hmm. so. So I think that's part of it. And then on the, the cultured side, I think that's an interesting evolution. And, and um, there's going to be some labeling challenges for sure. People will have to figure out how do you, what do you call, you know, uh, chicken that's been raised in a cultured environment? Is it, is it chicken or is it cultured chicken? And and, and, uh, and gaining consumer trust with that. So, um, but I do think the clean, I don't think cultured meat is not clean. Uh, you know, it, it's a question about whether it's profitable and viable as a business, but I don't, I wouldn't say it's not clean. Do you see, I know you've got a fiduciary uh, obligation to two very different tracks here. Yes. But do, you, do you see um, trends that uh, lead you in your choices? I obviously have made the bet on plant-based. I just I, I see the 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 level of um, pace of improvement being so rapid that it's you know we're confident you know we're getting we're nearing this point. I've I've called it the flipping point, partially because I'm a burger guy as opposed to the tipping point. But a flipping point, you know, we're within five years of right now. People say, why do you need plant-based meat? Um, I think five years from now you're going to have we're going to have a taste advantage or parity. We're going to have a nutritional advantage for sure. We already have an environmental advantage, and within five years we'll have a cost advantage. So then the, the question flips, and they said, "Why do you need animal-based meat?" Okay, sorry, Walter. So let's hear your thoughts on science base and this this dichotomy that. Just yeah, well, you, the, you, the question is right. There's there's this revolution in biology, chemistry, genomics, uh, and machine learning, compute, computational data. But I, I'm a retailer, so you'd expect me to step, hop over to the customer and say, the customer is ultimately going to have to be the one that says, this is something that I want. I think, as I was talking to Michael uh, Paul about this the other day, is really like, we're, there, there is this, uh, science is enabling a whole new set of choices, whether it's cell-based meat, whether it's uh, plant-based chicken, uh, whether it's uh, indoor agriculture, uh, any of these things that are, that, whether it's new ingredients, um, this whole thing is unfolding very quickly. The question is, does the customer want to eat a lab experiment? Does the customer want to eat a science experiment? No, the customer wants to eat food. And yeah. at that point, the customer also expects and will expect uh, transparency and will not support ultimately over five years from now. I believe the flipping question there is going to be, if you're not transparent about what you're doing and how you're doing it, you're probably not going to earn support from the customers, particularly the younger ones. So mm -hmm. I think the question, it's very much a, it's very much a unfolding question. I don't think we yet know exactly how the customer will respond to all this various sets of choices except we do know based on even your little poll there at the start there is a growing appetite for plant-based food there just is and research is going to you know, remember now we have uh what we're going to have in the next five years is the convergence of the food system and the healthcare system we're spending 20 percent of our gdp on healthcare right now okay that number will grow to 25 percent by 2025 there's no way that's sustainable that's spent and so these systems will come together science will play a role as it becomes more evidence-based for the functionality of food and food starts to carry you know, more is discovered in the plant universe. Science unlocks the wisdom. We're using less than 1% of, of the plant material in our food supply right now. And as Seth pointed out, there's uh, six plants and you know five meats or something like that. We, and there's a hundred crops grown commercially around the world. We're using six or eight or eight of them. You know, yeah. so, so there's a whole more of diversity in the future. I know the customer will, will embrace that, but 
This is very much a, an open question. And I think the answer lies in what Seth said about poetry is that we need some guardrails. We need guardrails around uh, technology and science for humanity, for the benefit of humanity. So does it have a nutritional benefit? Does it have a functional benefit? Does it have a taste benefit? What's the benefit of doing this and for what purpose? And I think those guide rails need to be created. Much like we had to create the organic guardrail, there needs to be a set of guardrails around this new set of questions. That work has really is really just beginning right now. Yeah, precisely. You know, um, I'm smiling because I'm having dinner with Michael tonight, and I know we're going to be talking about CRISPR uh, because he's he's in pursuit of this whole question of standards. And now you've got this word regenerative, yep. you know, being thrown around, which I so appreciate, Seth. You're reminding everybody that there is no such thing as regenerative unless you're organic. That's why yep. it's regenerative organic standard. Um, and, um, you know, uh, of course, when we fought the GMO labeling fight, it was really because of the herbicides, you know, it was the, yeah. un, it was the, the, the dark side that wasn't being talked about. These were chemical companies using GMOs to promote herbicides. But now you've got a new technology that's staying within the species, right? It's kind of like the question of uh, hydroponic organic, which, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to get myself in trouble here, but I began my career doing, as you guys both know, organic fish farm nutrient supplied, organic hydroponics. It was organic, it didn't have soil. So we gotta, you know, as you say, get these guardrails and set these standards. But I will, I will quickly say that um, to your point, Seth, the other night I served Michael and Alice uh, Waters and Michael's wife, um, our new mycelium bacon, which is farmed to your point, it's grown, it's the real deal. And I was fully expecting to be ravaged by, you know, Madam, you know, Whole Foods, small farmer, and she loved she loved the product. And the reason she did it goes back to something you both said a few minutes ago. Before I go to the next question, it it nailed it on taste. That's it. It nailed it. On, it was a sensual experience, sensory experience. So, and sensual, sensual. By the way, just one of the really neat things about food that's always worth remembering: food is the only experience we have as humans that taps all five senses. You know. Art, you just listen to music, you might feel the vibrations, but food is every aspect. So it is, it is, it's sensual, it's personal, you're putting it in your body. Oh, it is point. the whole, whole thing. And, and the reason it matters in this moment is because it touches every aspect of human existence, right? Right. right. Whether, you know, the planet, whether it's, you know, all. So it's- Preventative uh, healthcare, yep. yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I, we have a wide range of questions. So one's very nitty. Um, Susan says, I love the sample pack. Seth, what do you think of doing something like having the retailer put one in every curbside pickup order? Since so many people are shopping online and picking up their groceries without entering the stores, would that be- I love it. That's a great idea. Thank you, Susan. No, because, um, you know, the problem we have, our pouches are uh, six, our retail is about $6 a a bag. So this all of a sudden makes us, you know, gives us the chance to to make it, you know, you get a taste, a tease, if anything, and hopefully get you interested more. So that's a great idea. Thank you. And I hope Walter, I hope everybody's hearing Walter's comment because it was certainly uttered by our friends from NCG and Infra the other day and Costco and Thrive that uh, these retailers want in, they want sampling, they want to get product, they they need our they help. They need it, there. yeah. So this, finding new solutions is really good. Um, here's a different direction uh, that we've all talked about. And of course you're both investors. so. Um, Daryl's asking, what's the best way to vet out the perfect partner? I know that all money is not good. Not all money is good. <laughs> no, not all, not all money is created equal. So it's really about finding uh, values aligned money for, for you. And at the right time, as Seth pointed out, it, that's really, the, the, that's really the, the touch point. How do so. people know though? I mean, you, everyone uses the words, right? How do you well, know? You look at, you know, what people have done. Look at what they've done with their lives. You know, somebody who says, oh, all of a sudden, I'm really passionate about plant-based protein, but, you know, they're investing in, you know, heavy metals or, or <laughs> you know, I mean, I, 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 I certainly when I look at an employee, if someone says, I'm really passionate about this, you know, show me where you've done something that reflects that. And I think that's, as an as a entrepreneur, you have the right to ask every question because you are entering a relationship that's going to be one that can make or break your business. And you certainly wouldn't pick a, you wouldn't pick an employee without asking those questions. You wouldn't, you wouldn't pick a, a spouse without really understanding that. So uh, don't be afraid to ask tough questions. And if they, if you get some pushback, that's all you need. 
In other words, you're interviewing the money as well as the money interview. Oh, totally. Yeah. And, and then, you know, obviously look at what they've done with other companies and talk to the other entrepreneurs they've invested in and, and uh, you know, see how they fared. What do you think? That's, I, I would echo that point. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, look at the body of work that they've done, who, which other companies are they a part of, and then actually talk to the entrepreneurs there and find out what their experience has been. They will tell you when they, they'll tell you whether there's good partnership there or not, uh, because you're, you're coming from the same place. So doing your homework on it. Uh, and then, you know, I mean, how do you know? It's like, how, how did you know when you met Meg that you were going to marry her? Right. I mean, I mean, on oh, some yeah. level here, you knew, you knew, right. So, yeah. And so you just, you know, you, but I think, I think there's also maybe a process where you ask them to articulate what are their values. They're running a business, just like you're running a business. They're running the money business and we're in the food business. Right. But they still, they still have a set of values. They still aspire to go to work and do something good in the world. So asking them to articulate what their values are and um, so that you can see if they line up with yours is a good exercise. It, it also helps if they have some experience in food. It's not a prerequisite, but a lot of times tech investors will you know, say, we want to get into food. And then they expect you to scale the business the same way and say, hey, I got to put you know, mushrooms in the ground. I've got to you know, get a packaging line set up. I mean, so, so yeah. you just want to make sure they have some context. Well, let me press you both a tad. Uh, you know, at the Institute coming up May 6th, 7th, 5, 6, 7, on the 7th, we have our pitch day. I want to remind everybody, if you have a pitch, get it in. In fact, the two guys on the screen here will be among the, yes. the now 55 yeah. investors who will be there. And we have the whole gamut, right? We have- But I should share, this is where, I, you know, my first Hirschberg Institute or its precursor was where I got my, you know, one of my best investors, so it's That's an amazing true. opportunity. All right, good. I, I, I didn't in, intend to set you up for that, but that was a good comment. Yeah. I mean, actually, I will say 70% of the last two Institute pitchers got money, so I'm happy with that. But uh, we'll have the whole spectrum, right? We'll have angels, we'll have like folks like you guys, but we'll have, and we'll have private funds, and we'll have some strategics, and we'll have, and um, I'm curious if you'd both comment on, so you've talked about fit in terms of values, but what about fit in terms of expectations? Um, a lot of entrepreneurs uh, are not necessarily ready to be pushed, but I think some need to be pushed. Yeah, right? yeah. If, you're, if, so, you don't, if you're not willing to be challenged as an entrepreneur, you're, you're just not in the right game. Well, I'm talking, okay, I'm, I'm asking a very particular question, which is, you know, um, five years to sell or to IPO or yeah. or, or oh, hit, that, hit yeah. some number that is above what you, I mean, how do you counsel people if there's yeah. a different I think, I think you have to be really transparent about what you're doing. And so, you know, as um, this isn't, uh, none of the companies that, that are going to be at your, at the Institute are, are a five-year flip, you know, it's, it's, it's a long build and, and you have to make sure the entrepreneur understands that because there are, there are, there are venture funds that have a five-year cash out window and you say, that's just not going to work. Uh, right. It's not, not how, not how we're thinking about the business. Yeah. I'd be transparent as you can be in every aspect. Yeah. Well, and, the thing, the thing is you're going to need multiple rounds of money. You're not going to just take it once and then very, that just doesn't happen. So <clears throat> you want to make sure a, the partnership B, you want to, you want to think about maybe having multiple partners and uh, getting that dating process started earlier. And, but the other thing is also, Seth, you can probably speak to this. You don't want to be spending all your time raising money. You want to be able to be growing. The company, right. So how do you strike the balance? I mean, that's, I'm kind of curious. It's how did challenging you our first 20 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. You know, I, I, as I look back, it was it was easily 60% of my first few years was raising money. And you can argue that was not the best use of my time. How did you get away with only <laughs> I'm, I'm spreading that out. But, you know, ultimately it forces you to prove, uh, it, it does two things. It pr prove the proposition, really focus on getting your cash flow right. So it is, it is a... Um, it's like taking a bad medicine, but it's making sure you're going to get healthy. So, so it is the, the CEO's job to, to, to bring the resources in. And, and, and I'm, I don't like the idea of giving away too much too early because then you, you're, you're losing control. So uh, painful as it is, it, it's, you know, you got you to do it. Um, uh, Paloma, I'm jumping because I want to be sure we keep hitting uh, all the questions, uh, and I've got a big one from Dean in a moment about culture, which I think is a really good one. 
But how important is it to label food as plant-based to drive choice for many of these new plant-based foods we're talking about, like fungi burgers? Uh, I yeah. mean, do you, is it important? I, I guess the, just the question is, is it important to be sure you keep saying plant-based even if it's not, not a plant per se, it's obviously not animal. I mean, fungi. Yeah. Is well, I think anytime you're at an occasion where there's potentially not plant-based, you have to make that distinction. I, I remember people saying, well, you, you should be tell, saying honest tea is plant-based. I'm like, well, you can't, you can't have an animal-based tea. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I guess you could if you put fat oh, in it, but God, yeah, know. no, but so, but, but of course in the burger space or the, you know, or, or the jerky space, any place where there's the potential, you know, plant-based is the, is we've, you know, got the right term and vegan is, is not the right term. And, and yes. uh, you know, even, um, you know, saving the earth is not the right term. It's plant-based is a, is a quick um, shorthand that people know what it means. So I would use it with abandon. We do. <laughs> yeah. Um, you concur, Walter, I take it. I do agree with that, yes, yeah, exactly. It's uh, the language is, I mean, words matter. Words matter, uh, they express things and you know, you choose your words consciously. And uh, you know, uh, the plant-based thing is a much wider, much more welcoming, much more inviting uh, word. Than non Non-judgmental. Yeah. And so, yeah, and, it and you can see it's just, you can see that even in the poll in this group here where folks responded to that as, they want more, you know, basically we have a world that's unfolding retail, it, more, choice in formats, choice in platforms, choice in way you pay, choice in way you shop. Customers are saying they like the choices, right? And they, they require the choices, not only for health and safety reasons, but because they like the freedoms that they bring. And so I think that there's something about the term plant-based that really represents that sort of element of choice and uh, people don't feel judged and they feel like they can move to it at their own pace and their own speed. Yeah, well said. Uh, by the way, Manoli uh, shared on the chat uh, the latest 2020 uh, retail sales on plant-based foods from Good Food Institute and Spins uh, came out yesterday. So yeah. look to download, hit that Very link. Encouraging. Um, so uh, last night I had dinner with a CEO friend who, who uh, both of you know, uh, who uh, leads a major uh, plant-based food company. And when he came into it, uh, a well-known name, when he came into it, uh, he had, uh, he inherited over 200 SKUs. And I told him at that time, uh, he was going to have to, this, he wasn't gonna be able to make money and fund innovation until he shrunk them. And there were a lot of founders, babies, and you're both founders. There are a lot of precious products in that mix, a lot of legacy products, a lot of loyalty. Well, I hadn't fully checked in with him for a few years and he reported to me last night, company is killing it on profitability, but he shaved two thirds of the SKUs off. In other words, sacrificed a lot of babies, threw a lot of them over. Hate to use that graphic yeah. analogy, but that's, you know, people feel passionate about these. And of course, operations was cheering, sales was freaking out, marketing, you know, dealt with it, but obviously it's, it's, it's worked. Dean Nelson is asking, and this is, I think where we'll wrap up because it's a little bit of philosophy. Uh, can you please ask about the role of integration of passion and culture, the, the values you guys began talking about today and that's really underlying this whole discussion. The, the role that integration of passion and culture plays in relation to ops, operations, how you, func how you function, how do the two integrate? The question is how important is the relationship between culture and operations, how important is passion? Obviously, you can't, you know, as a carpenter friend of mine says, he loves carpentry because you can't bullshit a nail, right? I mean, the <laughs> nail still has to go in and you have to be uh, functional and you've got to be efficient and you've got to be rigorous and Seth, you and I, and uh, you, we always benefit by having, uh, you know, in my case, Diane, you know, people who, yeah. who said no, Gary, or, you know, the bullshit detectors would go off. So I know, I didn't prepare you for this, but I think it's a very good one. And most of the folks watching are operators. So any reflections on Dean's good question? Go ahead, Seth. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think every organization wants to think of itself as a high performing organization. And so it's just funny. We just, we just had a, a bathroom repaired in our, I'm in the office and, uh, and it, it, there was a sign up for like a, a few days that said, you know, it's going to be repaired. And I said, you know, 
you want to fix the bathroom as soon as you can because you want people to understand you have zero tolerance for poor execution, whatever it is, you know, around product, around anything. And 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 we have enough people, but, but but there aren't that many people in the office, so we didn't need the extra bathroom. But I just didn't want to sign up there saying this is going to get fixed. And so, I think um, passion for execution it, that can be agnostic, but it ties into impact. Meaning, if you execute well, then you get to have the impact. If you don't execute well, you don't get impact. And so, so I really try to make sure people have the context. Everyone is passionate about our mission in, in, in the business. Um, but I want them to be equally passionate about execution. So tomorrow we're going into a store. Um, it's a small little store in DC, but we're going to hit every potential place of strip clip, you know, by the beer and, and a salad bar. And there should be mushroom drinking near there. We're just like, because that's all about execution too. And, and, you know, most people say, oh, why do I want to be in a store worship about merchandising? It's not, it's because that's where the, how we make impact happen. So, so we really try to create this culture of, passion um, because it's all in the, in, in service uh, of the mission. Yeah, well, really well said. Walter, final thoughts here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, to me, I, I think uh, they go together, right? Because, I mean, first of all, why live life unless you're living it with passion? I mean, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, why, why are you doing it? But but when you when you come to this, uh, this, this uh, notion of culture and operations, I mean, essentially, Whole Foods was an operation-driven business. I mean, in other words, it was uh, iterating and operating, building new stores, learning as it went. Marketing was following behind, trying to keep up with operations. And so we were very much an ops-driven culture, which, which is, you know, to the topic of today was innovation. You aren't going to innovate unless you're out there at the beachhead where the thing is happening, where the customer is shopping, where the experience is happening. That's where the actual innovation could happen. It takes the form, to use Kevin Johnson's language, of execution, like, you know, you're actually in stock, which by the way, you can't take that for granted today. these days. You've got to be out there checking, make sure your signs are up there, make sure your message is clear, but also around the product itself, right? So um, I don't know, I think whether you're, if you're a retailer, uh, you are, uh, I mean, I, you know, walk 70 stores a year uh, at LinkedIn. I'm mean, looking at every detail, just like the bathrooms were set. For me, it was the back of the house should look, it should be one standard, one store, one standard. The store should have a set of standards, right? So. I, I think you want to build a culture of excellence, uh, whether it's in operations or whether it's in the product or, and it, but it's all in service of the mission, like Seth said, that there's a reason the business exists to do what, what are you doing? Then the operation services that the culture is, is basically your values brought to life through the people because without the people, the business is just a museum anyways. So you, it's brought to life through the people and operations is the way it comes to the people. So they're all kind of woven together. I, um, I don't know if that speaks to the question, but- No, it uh, does, it does. It does, I mean, uh, Seth, you know, passion, execution, impact, the, the, the you know, three, they're all linked. Um, no, I appreciate it. And, and look, um, uh, we're gonna close here, uh, and I but I do wanna say, cause you just set me up for it. You know, Danny Meyer, who we, Walter's obviously on the board and Seth, you know, we all go back. Uh, you know, this is a guy who, uh, for those, I think, everybody knows Danny, but you know, he had his entire business sh shut down a year ago and now they're slowly reopening. And uh, you know, his standards for service, you know, you know, they're not going to do anything with a, with one, you know, bathroom not working or one glass, not profit perfectly uh, polished. And it's also about safety and keeping his people safe and, and not having them be thrown around, come back and then leave. And, so Danny's gonna actually join us at the Institute and talk about that process of reopening in COVID. So I, I hope uh, folks will uh, you know, join us and, and hear. We've got a few others talking about this idea of re, not just innovating, but re-innovating and being reborn in this time yeah. of COVID. But, but the, the bathroom story is a good story that Seth has told her because you know, there's a saying in retail, retail is detail. I'm sure that um, our retailers will all appreciate that. You know, it, 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 every detail does matter in retail yes. it, and, right. and including the bathroom and that sort of thing. So what Seth's broader message really, if you will, our, our guardrail or guide rail for innovation is around pay attention to the details. Right. You it's know, all in the details. Make sure that these uh, little things. I always, work, I always you know? say, and we'll, Carly, we'll go to the closing slides here, but I always say that, uh, you know, I could make the yogurt and ship it 3,000 miles. It was the last 18 inches that made all the difference. If 
if it didn't delight, then right. the rest of it was academic. Right. So uh, guys, uh, first, thank you. That was thank you, Gary. Thank stimulating you and lots, lots of fun. So uh, contextually, um, next week, uh, Carleen, if you'll post these, um, we have one final uh, webinar in this series, which is about working with independence, which you both talked about. As I mentioned, Jimbo and Mike, you know, uh, Walter and Seth are both well aware. I mean, Earth Fair, amazing. They've launched 20 stores during COVID, literally since last June. And uh, Jimbo Samak, who's a legend and, you know, talk about uh, values and standards and a voracious quality, uh, you know, no stones left unturned. So we're gonna have a really fun discussion with those two. And then uh, don't forget, you can always look at our past webinars, including this one, the recording will be up tomorrow. Um, I've mentioned it a few times, uh, both my friends here will be involved. You can see Walter's picture. Um, our Institute is open, registration's happening. It's, uh, it's online, it's virtual, it's cheap, it's 50 bucks, uh, which just obviously covers the cost for our nonprofit. Um, the first day is gonna be financing and cash. So those questions about how you find a partner, you'll have panels uh, with uh, uh, folks talking about your case. If you can submit your, your financing challenge, uh, your, uh, we'll go into cash flow and how you avoid uh, the valley of death or minimize it, your time there. Second day is all about brand story, e-commerce. Oh, by the way, uh, you know Denise Woodward, Woodward and Lisa King here, two fabulous uh, women entrepreneurs who are also doing incredible innovation. In fact, Lisa's launched a new business um, on top of her very successful social venture in New Zealand. Uh, so they'll be talking to us. All. And then as I mentioned, day three is pitching and Remember, uh, you're not pitching to win a competition, you're pitching to get a second meeting with one or more of 55 investors who are showing up for this. Uh, so if you've got a pitch, if you've got uh, you know, something that you're trying to raise capital for something, it's, I can't think of a better day or way and, and you know, get, your, get your application in because we only have 13 slots for those. So you can go to hershberginstitute.com to register for that. Um, as ever, um, we welcome your feedback. Uh, and, uh, oh, thanks, Carlene. Yeah, our webinar next week, but also we will be resuming the webinars in a, a different format after uh, the Institute. You know, if you have a product or service uh, that benefits this community um, and you can summarize it in less than five, you know, pitch us. We'll, we'll give you some time up there. We, we didn't want to do it today because I really wanted to dive in with these two guys, but uh, let us know. So finally, I'll just say again, feedback. Uh, we, you know, this is about a service thing. It's about not just getting us through COVID, but really about attacking the values and challenges and problems that these guys talked about at the beginning that we all know why we're here. We, the world is burning, we're toxifying, we're hurting ourselves, we're, we're you know, farmers are coming up on the short end of the stick and, and the earth is, uh, you know, just been, been uh, abused for too long. And this is the path back, the kinds of things we've been talking about here. So we want to serve, we want to be better, we want to help all of us to be better. If you have feedback, if you have topics, if you have suggestions, if you have feedback on this webinar, I know these guys are welcome, would welcome it. Uh, please, you know, make this a two way street. And again, thank you to New Hope Network. And of course, thanks to Carlene for uh, putting uh, us on. And uh, with that, again, Seth, Walter, uh, many thanks. We will see you all next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.